Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at a data set of medical appointment no-shows. And so it says 30% uh, of the patients missed their scheduled appointments. And what we're going to try to do is use a bunch, uh, some data from each patient to try to predict whether or not they will be a no-show or not. So I don't know how successful we'll be. Um, it's hard to believe that um, <laughs> things like hypertension, diabetes, alcoholism, have something to do, uh, maybe something, I don't know. I guess I guess we'll see how, how good we are at predicting no-shows. So let's hop into the, the notebook. Um, we're going to use TensorFlow. Uh, I'm importing NumPy and Pandas just to work with the data, and then standard scalar and train test split function from sklearn for pre-processing. We'll use TensorFlow, like I said, for our model, and then uh, to evaluate the performance, we're going to be using classification report and confusion matrix from sklearn.metrics. So let's go ahead and load those in, and then we'll I'll load the data in using pandas.readcsv and we get the file path right over here uh, this CSV file, copy that, paste it in and take a look. Alright, so we have 14 columns and we're going to try to predict the no-show column. Uh, so there's a bit of a processing we have to do to this data. Uh, first thing to do would be to check out data.info uh, which is a nice way to look at it. You can also do data.describe uh, to get some statistics about each column. Um, although for pre-processing purposes this one's more useful, you can see there's no um, there's no null values. There's a uh, 110,000 rows and the, each row, uh, each column has 110,000 non-null values. Uh, so we do have some object columns we're going to have to uh, process. So why don't we do that first? Well, uh, we'll start with a little cleaning. So uh, Let's first get the total number of missing values just so that we can be sure we don't have any. Uh, so total missing values. And I'm going to get data.isNA. So this data frame right here, if I just run that one little line, uh, you can see isNA gives us false if there's, a, if there's a value there, and it'll give us true if there's a missing value. So if we sum over the rows, we'll get the number of missing values in each column, which looks like this, zero in each column. And then we're going to sum again over the columns to get the total missing values, which is zero. Okay, so we just wanted to double check with that. Uh, now let's drop a few rows. Um, so, uh, sorry, a few columns. If you look at this, the first two columns are not giving us useful information. Uh, a, a patient's ID is not what we want to use to predict. Um, a, also, appointment ID, which I assume is a unique identifier, uh, will not help us predict. Now, there may be some correlation. I don't know if the same patient has made multiple appointments in here. And you could consider keeping patient ID in uh, to use patient's past no-show experience uh, to try to predict. Um, you know, why don't we figure it out? Why don't we see how many of the, how many unique values are in patient ID? We can just get this with a uh, data sub patient ID dot unique and I took the length of this to see the number of unique values in here and there's 62,000 unique patients so there may actually be some useful information in this column uh, because there's about 40,000 uh, maybe 50,000 uh, of the of duplicate appointments right uh, so there's only 62,000 unique patients in here so there there may be some uh, correlation between if a patient has been a no-show in the past and uh, like but th but the problem with this is we'd be building a model that works best with patients that have already been trained on and we want a model that's going to work with anyone I mean we are uh, obviously limited to people in the neighborhoods uh, that are in the in the neighborhood column uh, but it, it really comes down to what you're trying to do. Um, if we want a sort of general model that will work with anyone, um, we will keep this patient ID off uh, because if we keep it on, it will be biased towards patients that have already been to the doctor. So I, I'm going to drop it uh, for our purposes, but you may want to keep it depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, so I'm going to drop patient ID. And then uh, I should probably, let me just check the appointment ID column data sub appointment ID 
unique, and I'll get the length again to see how many unique appointments there are. And yeah, as I expected, this is a unique identifier, so it's completely unhelpful in getting us and helping us predict uh, the uh, if they were a no-show. So I'm dropping patient ID and appointment ID, and I'll specify access one so that we're dropping columns. And with that, we are done cleaning because there were no missing values. Uh, now we're on to, I think before we encode any of the values, let's do some feature engineering for the date columns. So if we look at the data now, uh, we don't have those two columns at the beginning, but we have these uh, scheduled day and appointment day. And I want to, uh, I want to make separate features out of each of these values. So I want a year feature, um, a month feature, and a day feature. And I want an hour feature, minute feature, and I don't know if a second feature is really necessary, but we'll do it anyway. Uh, just so you can see how to do this. Um, first, I'm going to rename these columns because uh, I want actually, I want scheduled day to refer to just this number, the day. So I'm going to call this scheduled date, and this will be appointment date as well. So we can do that with a data dot rename, and specify the columns we want to rename. A dictionary that maps the old column name to a new column name. So scheduled day will become scheduled date, and appointment day will become appointment date. Uh, and once we do that, so I'll just run that. Oh, what's wrong? Oh, equals. Oh, I should specify in place true. Ah, I'll just do this, data equals. Now, if, if we look at data, these are called date and appointment date. So let's uh, get some new, so let's make some new columns. So let's have a column called scheduled year. And that's just gonna be the first four digits of uh, the date, time date uh, information. So what we can do is um, take the original scheduled date column and apply a lambda function to it that takes in some x, which will be one of these entire strings, and it will return x evaluated from 0 to 4. So that will just be the first four characters. So each date uh, feature, each date uh, entry will become just the year entry. And I want to turn it into an integer after that, so it's not a string anymore. And um, yeah, so let's test that Test that out. If we run that, take another look, we now have this scheduled year at the end that's just 2016, and that's an integer right there. And so we'll do the uh, similar thing for the month. The month will just be, instead of indexing from 0 to 4, it'll be 5 to 7, which will just be uh, these two. And that's going to be an integer as well. And I'll just do the next one. This will be the day. This is why I renamed the columns because I want scheduled day to be uh, just these two here, two, the 29 here. So that will be 8 to 9, uh, 8 to 10. Okay, um, then let's also copy this and let's get our minute second. And uh, so hour will be 11 to 13. Minute will be 14 to 16. And second will be 17 to 19. Uh, and then let's just grab the first three. And for the appointment days, you notice that we don't have any time data. It's all zeros. So I'm, no, I'm only going to use the first three from this, which will be the year, month, and day. And that'll be uh, so 0 to 4, 5 to 7, 8 to 10. However, these are going to be appointment instead. So I'll write appointment. Just copy that. And I'll go in and change each of these. So yeah, I can just select them all. And then select this one. Whoops, I forgot to hold shift. I mean, can, yeah, shift. Wait, is it, it's control, sorry. Yes, this and this and this. And I'll paste. And now they're appointments. And now if we, I'm just going to run the whole notebook again. Uh, if we look at data after that, we now have all these 
uh, month, day, hour, uh, sorry, year, month, day, hour, minute, second, and then year, month, day for appointment as well. And they all look pretty good. Uh, you'll notice now we can't see all the columns because we've gone over 20 columns, or 21. So let's go into the console. Oh, I, I should uh, resize this window. All right, right, so I'm going to the console down here. And why is it so small? All right, uh, pandas.set option max columns uh, to none. And that just basically runs a block of code without having to put it in the notebook. Uh, we can see now, we can see all the columns. And uh, we don't have, we still have these, these ones here. We don't need these anymore. So let's go ahead and uh, drop those two columns. Uh, Data.drop, scheduled date, and appointment date. from access one. And I'll just include this in the same block. And let's re reload the notebook now. Alright, so we don't have, we, we are back to 19 columns and we don't have to worry about that anymore. Alright, so we're ready to start encoding. So whenever I want to start encoding, usually the first thing I'll do is take a look at the data types of the, uh, not exactly the data types, take a look at the unique values in each categorical feature. So you can get the categorical features um, by doing data.selectDtypes and just pass an object, which will just uh, get any strings. And you see there's only three, uh, three features that are non-numeric. We have the neighborhood, gender, and then no-show, which is what we're trying to predict. So it's not a feature, but it's a column. We want to encode these appropriately. Now let's get a list of the unique values in each one. Uh, so let's turn this into a dictionary. It's going to map a column name to uh, a list. Uh, it doesn't have to be a list actually. How about just the unique values in the column for every column in data.selectDtypes object dot columns. Right, so if I just take you through this, we have this, uh, if I get the dot columns of this, it'll just be a list of the uh, the column names that have object D type. And if I now create a dictionary that maps every one of these names to the unique values in that name, in that column, we'll get this, which is our gender has two unique values, neighborhood has this many unique values, and no show has two. So we have two binary columns and one nominal column. So what I'll do is create two functions for encoding, binary encode and one hot encode. One hot will be for the nominal feature and binary will be for the gender and for no show. So this is going to take in a data frame, a column and a positive value. And uh, this will be a simple function. First, let's just make a deep copy of our data frame and then let's edit the data frames column of our choosing uh, so that we apply a lambda function to it. That's going to take in some x, which will be a, uh, this is binary, so it'll be one of these or one of these. And if x equals uh, the positive value that we specify, then uh, we're going to make the value of the function become 1. So if, one if, x equals positive value, and otherwise it'll be zero. So we're going to pass in, uh, well, we'll specify the positive values. It's arbitrarily chosen. Convention would be we'd make yes positive and male positive, but it really doesn't matter. It can be anything. Uh, and then at the end, we'll return df. Now one hot code, we're going to take in a data frame, a column, and a prefix for the one hot columns. And we'll start off again by creating a copy of our data frame. And then we'll create some dummies, which will use pandas.getDummies for a given column and the given prefix. Prefix equals prefix. So get dummies will create one hot columns from a nominal feature. So for example, pandas.getDummies 
for data sub neighborhood, where neighborhood is our nominal feature here, uh, looks like this. It takes each neighborhood and creates a new uh, column, so a new column for every unique value, and then we'll have all zeros for a given example, except in one place. You can see there's a one. So all zeros except for one one. And the one signifies the original value of that example. So you can see it matches up. All right, so we can also specify a prefix. How about n for neighborhood? And then just an n goes at the beginning of each unique value. So we know where the, value, where the columns are coming uh, from. So here we're going to specify a column and a prefix and then create the dummies for that column. And we'll store it in dummies. And then we'll concatenate using pandas.concat the original data frame and the new dummies columns side by side. Then when we're done, all we have to do is drop the original column from which we created the dummies and return df. Okay, and that's it. Uh, now let's encode the three columns we need to encode. So first we'll do binary encoding. Uh, so data equals binary encode. Uh, we'll pass in data. The column will be gender. And the positive value will be uh, male, M. Then we'll do the same thing for the no-show column positive value will be yes. Uh, then uh, one hot encode we'll pass in data, the column will be neighborhood and the prefix here will be n. This can be anything. Okay, let's run that and take a look. And we now have 99 columns and that's because we have all these one hot columns at the end from the neighborhood. But you'll notice that our gender column is now binary and our no show column is now binary. All right, and so we're ready to split and scale the data. So I'll split the data into X and Y. Y will be what we're trying to predict, so that's the no show column data sub no show dot copy and x is going to be everything except the no show column so what we're trying to, what we're using to to predict it so uh, sorry data dot drop no show from axis one and we'll make a copy all right then I'll create a new scalar this will be a standard scalar from sklearn and we can use this to give each column in x uh, mean zero and unit variance so fit transform x uh, this will fit the scalar to the data, and then it will transform each column independently uh, so that each column is centered at zero and has variance one. So most of the values will lie between negative one and one. All right, then we'll split it again into train and test sets. X train, X test, Y train, Y test equals train test split. And uh, we're splitting X and Y. Uh, we'll give a train size of 70% and we'll include a random state so that we can reproduce the results. Okay. Uh, while I'm at it, I actually I want to seed TensorFlow. So right here, tf, which is TensorFlow, dot random, dot set seed. And this can be any number. Let's just make it 100. Uh, this will just ensure that we can reproduce the results from our model as well, which we're about to get into right here. So training. Let's create uh, a new TensorFlow model uh, using, we'll, we'll have layers, one will be input, uh, and we'll pass in the shape of our feature vector, which will be x uh, dot shapes of one, which if you look at this is 98, because we have 98 features. Uh, so this is all the columns except the no-show column. And then we're going to create two hidden layers, dense layers, with 64 activations each, and a ReLU activation function pass in inputs to the first one, and then I'll pass in x to the second one, and then for our outputs, we'll have a, another dense layer with one activation and a sigmoid activation function so that we get probability estimates for our positive class uh, between 0 and 1. Alright, then I'll create the model, which is tf.keras.model, and we can pass in the inputs and outputs, and then we'll compile the model 
Uh, we need to specify an optimizer, which we'll, we'll use Atom. A loss, which will be binary cross entropy. And some metrics. Uh, and so this is a good time to check the class distribution. So I'm going to print out class distribution. And so there's a few ways to get it. But remember that y, y train is an array of zeros and ones. So if we get the, if we were to get the sum of it, it would be the number of ones in the in the data. If we got the mean, it would be the number of ones divided by the length, which is precisely the percentage of ones in the data. And you see, there's only 20% of the ones. Uh, the other 80% are zeros. So I think over here uh, it said. Uh, why do 30% of their patients miss their scheduled appointments? Uh, but it looks like, based on this data, there's actually 20%. And if we did this just on the whole Y, we still, yeah, still get 20%. Uh, so let's print this out. I will format the string so that we can show, I guess, three decimal places is good. Uh, and then uh, we should. Yeah, I'll put a slash, and then another one. And then format, and we'll pass in the mean to the first one, and the uh, one minus the mean to the second one. Yeah, I'll do two decimal places. Looks nicer. Actually, why not just do one and then multiply these by a hundred and put little percentage signs at the end. All right. So this is the class distribution, positive to negative. Um, I should specify that positive to negative. 20% positive, 79% negative, or 80%. Okay, so because of this, we're not going to use just accuracy. Accuracy is not such a great metric when we're dealing with imbalanced classes. Because uh, let's say we only predicted uh, negative, we'd have a 79.9% accuracy. But our model's not doing anything important, I mean, anything good. So we're going to use AUC which is a much nicer metric for imbalanced classes. And it, um, it takes into account performance with each class and also uh, performance across various classification thresholds. Uh, so we'll classify at 0.5. Uh, that's simply because it's binary. Um, but uh, don't worry about it. It's just a better metric. So let's uh, now fit the model and store its history in history. So I'm going to train on the train set, x train, y train. I'm going to give it a validation split of 20%, pass in some uh, batch size, 32, and epochs. We can do it for 100 epochs, and then have a callback function, uh, which will it'll be tf.keras.early stopping. And we'll monitor a value, validation loss and give it a patience and restore best weights. So I'll explain what this is. Um, this callback will monitor a certain value and when it stops improving after three epochs, it will stop the training and restore the weights from the best epoch. Uh, so we don't have to manually adjust the epochs to get good results. All right, and then let's, let's go ahead and train it. And what's wrong? Oh, I forgot this should be tf.keras.callbacks.early stopping. All right. And while it's training, let's set up the uh, results. So first we'll evaluate the model on the test set. And then I also want to get the classification report and the confusion matrix. For that, we're going to need the true values of y, which will be uh, and this is from the test set, y test. Uh, let's make y test into a numpy array. 
and store it in y true. And then y pred will be uh, model.predict x test and we'll check because this will be probability values, the predictions are actual probability values given by the sigmoid activation. So if it, if the value is over 0.5, which means uh, the positive uh, the positive class is receiving a higher uh, probability than the negative, then we will turn that into an array with type numpy.int. Sorry, dtype equals numpy.int. So this will become a Boolean array of whether or not a given prediction is over 0.5, and this will this will turn it into an integer array of ones and zeros. And then we'll we'll actually have to squeeze that because it's a, a model that predicts returns a two-dimensional array, but we need a one-dimensional array in order to compare these two. So I'm squeezing down to one dimension. All right, and then we'll print out uh, the classification report. And um, it will be classification report. This is from sklearn. And we're passing in y true and y pred. All right, and then we'll do another one for the confusion matrix. And this will be confusion matrix, also from sklearn. All right, so for, let's evaluate on the test set. We get an accuracy of 79.6 and an AUC of 7, uh, 0 0.707, 708. So uh, it's pretty good. I'm actually surprised by how well this model is performing. I didn't know that no shows were so easy to predict, um, but it, it's it's uh it's not so bad mm, considering the task. Uh, let's get some predictions, and then get the classification report and the confusion matrix. So uh, from this, you can see. In our negative class, which was the larger class, uh, we have very good uh, performance. So precision means out of all of the uh, out of all the examples that we predicted negative, this is how many we got right. This is, this is the percentage that we got right. And recall is out of all the uh, values, out of all the examples that were actually negative, um, this is how the percentage that we this is the percentage that we predicted correctly. And you see this is this is almost perfect. Uh, so within the um, zero class, which means they were not a no-show, uh, we did very well. And F1 score is a combination of precision and recall. Um, then in our positive class, you can see we did not do so well. And in fact, our recall is very low and our F1 score is very low. So we had a much harder time predicting if a patient would be a no-show. So based on this classification report, and then based on the confusion matrix here, uh, so th this, the zero index is the true negatives uh, for the zero class. This is how many negative values we got correct, and this is the true positives, how many positive values we got correct. This is the values that were actually negative, but we predicted positive, so false positives. And this is the value that was actually positive, but we predicted negative, the so false negatives. And you can see our false negatives are much higher than our true negatives. Uh, so we were not really able to predict well uh, if a patient would be a no-show. So I think this accuracy value and maybe even the AUC value is a little misleading here. Um, our, our model's not really doing what we wanted to do. If we look at this, the relationship between the true negatives and the uh, false negatives, 344 divided by, uh, well, we can add them together for, to get the total number of negatives, 6388. You can see only 5% of the negatives we actually classify correctly, and that's what's reflected by the recall value here. So, um, yeah, I, I think that that will... Uh, sum up today's video. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.